Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. We're going to dive back into some Historia Civilis today. They are really, really close to a million subscribers and I can think of few channels on this platform that cover historical content that deserve it more. So uh, if you have not already done so, please click on the link down in the description that I'll put here to this video so you can head over there and subscribe to Historia Civilis if you like what you see. Uh, They're less than 10,000 subscribers away from a million, so I would love to see them hit uh, that big milestone very, very soon. Uh, so we've looked at a lot of their other videos, some of their Roman uh, Empire stuff, or well, Roman Republic stuff. Uh, we've taken a look at their really good uh, take on the Congress of Vienna. And now we're going to pick up right where the Congress of Vienna leaves off. So if you haven't seen that series, I'll put a link down in the description to that so you can check out my reaction to that. Uh, this is The Year Without a Summer which is actually 1816 to 1824 are the years that are going to be covered. This is in the aftermath of one of the most consequential uh, historical events in all of human history, uh, the Napoleonic Wars, which completely reshape Europe and therefore the world. Uh, so we'll, we'll probably do this in two parts because it's a 43-minute video. Uh, so I'll kind of stop somewhere at the halfway point. We'll pick up where we left off tomorrow with part two of this reaction. If you are a member or a patron, you'll get access to part two right away. I'll put that up a day early so you'll be able to go and check that out right away. Uh, the links will be posted here on YouTube for uh, members only and then over on Patreon for our patrons. Uh, so if you want to learn more about how to do that, you can click on the Patreon link. Before we do that, though, I want to thank Leonel in Chandler, Arizona. My mom lives there in Arizona, so that's awesome. I uh, hope you're staying cool there. It's super hot here in Ohio this week, so hopefully it's not too bad in Arizona right now. Leonel, thank you so much for your support on Patreon. Let's go ahead and dive into this video. 16, and after almost 25 years of unrelenting warfare, Europe had been at peace for one year. The reprieve had been a blessing. In England, one could see a familiar sight. The wind was still bitterly cold, and the sky was still gray, but the snow was finally starting to retreat from the hills, and the trees had just begun to bloom. Farmers shuffled about in their fields, fretting over whether they planted too early. They took inventory of their winter stores, and wondered if they might go hungry before the first harvest came in. These were all normal sights for the early spring. But this yeah, uh, and it's something we all take for granted today, right? The idea that your life could be made or broken by the weather. Uh, most of us take for granted we can just go down to the grocery store and buy the food we need. We're not dependent on whether there was an early frost or whether there hasn't been enough rain. But these were things that were life and death, quite literally, to millions of people at this time. This year, something had gone terribly wrong. This was all happening in June. Mm. They called 1816 the year without a summer. It happened for complicated reasons, but basically there was an unlucky combination of volcanic eruptions that altered global weather patterns for two or three years. In this has been so many times in history where this has happened, and every time there's been one of these massive volcanic eruptions that spews you know, millions of cubic meters of dust into the atmosphere and it stays up there for a while, it lowers the global temperature by just a couple of degrees and that changes everything. Because if it lowers the average temper by a cup, temperature by a couple of degrees, that means there are places where it's more extreme. And uh, look throughout history, 1816 is just one mild example of this. Some parts of the world, the changes were relatively minor and went by unnoticed, but in others, the changes were catastrophic. In Europe, they happened to be catastrophic. That July turned out to be the coldest July on record. That summer turned out to be the coldest summer on record. And, and think about the context of this. This is all happening in the immediate aftermath of a generation of warfare on the European continent that cost millions of lives, both military and civilian. They're finally recovering from this, and now this happens. That decade of the 1810s would be the coldest decade in 500 years, all the way back to the 1300s. You might be thinking to yourself, okay, so it was unusually cold. 
But the problem wasn't just that it was cold. The problem was that nothing grew. Mm. Most plants don't really grow unless the temperature is above 10 degrees Celsius. In London, England, it's below 10 degrees for about 66 days on the average year. In 1816, it was below 10 degrees for 146 Dang. days, which meant that there were significant non-growing periods Massive. scattered throughout the spring and into the summer. That fact alone would have been enough, but there was another issue. The changes to the weather caused most of Europe to be unusually overcast and rainy. Farmers in France usually had to deal with eight days of rain per month in the summer. In 1816, they had 20 days of rain per month. In England, crops had just begun to sprout when they got eight straight weeks of rain. The rain led to flooding, and wherever there was flooding, crops failed. Northern France and the Netherlands basically turned into one giant swamp. And the Netherlands is by and large below at or below sea level anyway so they've already had to build massive systems to be able to keep a lot of this ground dry enough to inhabit and to farm so any little bit of extra rain is going to mess that up a massive amount devastating on average the cold temperatures and the rain pushed the harvest one month later than it should have been in france it was more like two months mm. Farmers rely in a country where they've lost millions of their citizens already, so they're already dealing with a nightmare scenario when it comes to producing crops and and just going about business. On early harvests to replenish their stores and get them through the summer. But this year, with the harvest pushed back a month or more, you instead saw widespread famine in the early summer. It became common to see people picking through abandoned fields that had been lost to flood eating unripened or rotten plants straight out of the mud. This when you're desperate, you know, people sit here and think, I'd never do that. You don't know what you would do until you're in that desperate of a situation and you are literally starving. Was how Europe's century of peace began. After 25 years of war, after sending an entire generation of young men into the meat grinder, yep. people were reduced to picking through the fields for rotten food. Wow. What was it all for? The environmental catastrophe was nobody's fault, but people were furious at their own governments for allowing this to happen. And nowhere were they more furious than in France. People always want someone to blame, even when it's clear that there's nobody specific to blame. People still want to blame somebody. And in the absence of a real villain, a real uh, responsible party, People will make something up. Done it throughout history. France was broke. The people were starving. And the country was in the middle of an environmental catastrophe. The restored King Louis XVIII had come to power promising to lift a bunch of unpopular taxes on the poor. But he was immediately forced to break that promise. So Louis the Eighteenth is the uh, younger brother of Louis the Sixteenth. I know sounds weird when you think about it that way, but it has happened before. King George the Sixth of England uh, had a brother named George, also. So, um, and his name wasn't George anyway; it was Albert. But uh, Louis was just a really popular name to have for monarchs. The grumbling began immediately. Conditions in France had never been this bad under Napoleon. As part of the yeah, Napoleon's still alive at this point. He's he's exiled in the middle of the South Atlantic, but he's alive until 1821. Compromise that restored the king to power. France operated under a new liberal constitution, but the constitution was weak. France now held regular elections, but the king had the power to throw out the results whenever he wished. His ministers did not answer to the public, they answered to him. This actually made the new system weak and fragile. Say what you will about the British system, but at least the British Prime Minister took most of the heat. If things were really going badly, replacing the Prime Minister was an uncomplicated and yet mm. meaningful act. Now the French had a Prime Minister too, but their Prime Minister was just an extension of the King's will. If things were really going badly, Replacing the Prime Minister would not be enough. 
they may need to replace the king. Which they've done before to his brother. Uh, it, you know, it hasn't been much more than 30 years at this point since that happened. The restored About 30 King years. Louis XVIII wisely selected a liberal named Richelieu as his first prime minister. The centrists in France at this time were extremely supportive of the new French constitution, were comfortable with many of the reforms of the French Revolution, and also favored the restoration of the monarchy. They were trying to split the difference between the ultra-conservatives who favored increasing the power of the king and the aristocracy, and the republicans who wanted to disseminate more power to the people. So before the Napoleonic Wars even, think about everything that France has been through with really what amounts to a war between the regular people and the nobility and the clergy. Uh, and so, you know, they fought this bloody war uh, of revolution and then had all the Napoleonic Wars that came after as a direct result, all because of this conflict between the two. So it seems probably to a lot of the regular folks unfathomable that you would go back to giving more power to the king and continue the work of the French Revolution. The king favored the ultra-conservatives, but he correctly assessed that there would be a popular uprising yeah, if he came out of the there. gates pushing their agenda. The centrists would have to do for now. The selection of Richelieu was perhaps the wisest decision the king ever made. Richelieu was a steady hand and inspired trust abroad. In 1818, he successfully negotiated with the great powers for the removal of the armies that were occupying France, and for the end of France's reparation payments. In only three years, Richelieu had returned France to its rightful place as an equal great hmm. power, and it had all been done diplomatically. And, and think about, I mean, contrast that then to 100 years later when you have the events of the end of the First World War, when you have the reparations. Even you could go back and look at the aftermath of the Franco-Prussian War and the reparations that are put on France. Uh, debilitating reparations have repercussions. The fact that France so quickly is restored to its kind of natural status as a, a great power in Western Europe in the years afterwards is a very stabilizing factor for them and for the, and for the world. France didn't even have to fight a war to reestablish itself on the international stage. A small miracle. But Richelieu was not rewarded for his hard work. For three elections in a row, the French Republican left made substantial gains in their... Makes sense. When you have, you know, I don't know who all has the right to vote at this point, but you have to think that a lot of them are going to be on the anti-monarchist side. So it doesn't surprise me that that's the direction that the average elector, uh, the average voter is going to be on. Their annual elections. The king was forced to dismiss Richelieu in favor of a prime minister who could draw support from the Republicans. Obviously, this went against everything that the king stood for, and without the king's support, this new prime minister was not able to achieve anything meaningful. Let's pause there for now. France had successfully reintegrated itself back into the international system by forging a moderate path led by centrists like Richelieu. And let me just say again, and I say this every time we do a Historia Civilis video, I love how he presents this stuff. It's not flashy. He's using squares to represent people in many cases. He's just using some text on a screen, but it works. This goes to show you that it doesn't have to be slick graphics and amazing editing if you've got good information and you present it in such a way that people can digest it. You're going to be effective. And that's why I think he deserves every bit of these million subscribers he has. France's politics had settled around a grand compromise between the royalist ultra-conservatives, the liberal centrists, and the radical republicans. France would have a monarchy and a liberal constitution. And I do have to say he missed an opportunity here to, uh, to make it red, white, and blue like the French flag instead of yellow, but that's okay. It would keep the reforms of the French Revolution. France would have an aristocracy, but it would also have elections. 
It wasn't quite a democracy yet, but it was on that path. Hold all of this in your head, because it will become important in a future video. Hmm. Oh, now we're going to look at Germany and see. I like how we're kind of doing these snapshots at each, uh, each major kind of country faction group that's involved here uh, to set the stage for the entire thing. While liberalism was taking hold in France, that wasn't necessarily true for the rest of continental Europe. Over in the newly formed German Confederation, German nationalism was on the rise. And, and you can kind of see here within this outline the beginnings of what is going to be modern day Germany, which really is kind of right here and really for a good bit of time included all of this over here because you've got Prussia over here uh, and you've got Saxony and you've got Bavaria down here and Württemberg and the Pal Palatinate and all these different places. Plus you have Austria over here. And the other great powers were getting nervous. The two German great powers had different reactions to the nationalist movements within their borders. In the multi-ethnic Austrian Empire, the instinct was to tamp it down. In the mostly German-speaking Prussia, they decided to lean into it. The King of Prussia sent Hardenberg, his Prime Minister and Foreign Minister, to meet with Metternich, the Chancellor and Foreign Minister of Austria. And you'll remember Metternich in particular from the Congress of Vienna. He's obviously it taking place in Vienna. He's one of the, the prime movers behind all of that. The Prussians wanted to reform the German Confederation, to which both Prussia and Austria were members. Riding the wave of German nationalism, the Prussians wanted to revive talks of a united German empire uniting the German-speaking peoples of Central Europe. This is just a few years after the end of the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire ceases to exist during the Napoleonic Wars. So now that that has been fractured, all of the folks who were once part of the Holy Roman Empire are now looking for a new way to combine their powers. Because you look at France and the UK and Russia and Austria... Uh, well, Austria is part of the Germanic uh, peoples there, but you, you see these great powers and then you see that you're a bunch of smaller Germanic states and you're starting to think, how can we unite in some way? And it's going to take them a couple of generations to do it, but, but it's always a goal after the end of the Holy Roman Empire. Under one state. This new state would instantly become a new great power yep. with enough strength on their own to rival France. Hardenberg proposed that Prussia and Austria roll their territory into this new empire. But if that proved to be impossible, he alternately proposed that they could create a smaller German empire from the various small German states. In this scenario, Prussia and Austria could remain independent and control this new, smaller German empire as allies from the outside. Metternich was horrified by this idea. Hmm. After such careful and difficult negotiation at the Congress of Vienna to create the German Confederation, yeah. Prussia wanted to blow it all up after only three years? Why? Well, part of the reason I think, and maybe he'll touch on this, is how quickly France has recovered, at least politically. I don't think they expected that. What was wrong with how the Confederation was working? The German states had agreed to band together for military defense and to resist outside meddling. It was working. Central Europe was at peace. Prussia and Austria had the strength and the leverage to force their tiny German allies to do whatever they wished. Wasn't that enough? Why on earth would Prussia want to start negotiations all over again? Metternich's analytical mind went to work. Both Prussia and Austria controlled substantial Polish-speaking provinces in the east. If their new German Empire was home to a large Polish population, it's obvious what would happen next, isn't it? Poland would ask yep. to join the German Empire. Don't you think the Tsar of Russia would have something to say about <laughs> that? The Tsar of Russia. So this is showing Metternich's strategic mind. He's not just thinking about what is right now. He's thinking about if we do this, what's the next step and the step after that and the step after that. 
And he's kind of playing out the scenarios in his mind of what could go wrong with this. Whereas you have others who are just looking at how this benefits us now. And you need people like Metternich to kind of put the brakes on and say, listen, this I know this seems like a great idea on the surface, but think about the ripple effect if we do this and how that's going to transpire. Russia was the king of Poland, and he had threatened a war in order to pull Poland into Russia's sphere of influence only three years earlier. The new German Empire would instantly be on the brink of war. To what purpose? Because a bunch of young Germans in Berlin got caught up in the nationalist mood of the moment and thought that a German Empire sounded cool? What a mess. In order to appease Hardenberg and the German nationalists back in Prussia, Metternich proposed some minor reforms to the existing German confederation so that it might feel a little more like a unified empire. So again, here you have the strategic thinking is, I can't just reject this out of hand. I have to give them something. They have to feel like they got something because if they don't feel like they get anything, they're going to keep pushing for what I think would be a disaster. So how can we placate them in such a way that they feel like they got something that's going to keep them from continuing down this path, at least for now? The Confederation would operate a federal secret police to monitor any revolutionary activity. To the same end, freedom of the press would be standardized across the different German states and heavily restricted. Similarly, student associations at universities, traditionally a friendly home to revolutionary thought, would be outlawed across the confederation. So far, this doesn't seem like reform so much as cracking down so that these uppity uh, political operatives don't try and push for this again. To allow for all of this, the Confederation as a whole would now be able to force individual states hmm. to modify their domestic laws in the name of preserving order. Of course, in practice, these modifications would not be coming out of the small German states. The modifications would be coming out of Prussia and Austria. All of these reforms have a certain flavor to them, don't they? Yeah. Metternich was the conservative architect of the post-war order, and it's clear where his priorities lay. His singular focus was on preventing a French-style revolution from breaking out in Germany, an understandable fear, having just lived through 25 years of war. But I would argue that it was a preoccupation that drove him to distraction. We have the advantage of knowing what would happen in the future, and we know that debate over a potential German Empire would be one of the key questions of the 19th century. Yep. Metternich had no way of knowing this, but there would be three wars fought over this issue, to say nothing of the 20th century, my god. So he, he may not have had any way of knowing what would happen, but he could see it. He, he's a pretty forward-thinking guy. He's anticipating what would happen. Much like a few generations later when you have a guy like Otto von Bismarck, who uh, is Chancellor of Germany, uh, who's saying that some war would happen in, in, in Gulf Europe because of some damn fool thing in the Balkans. Well, he was 100% right about that. Sometimes you just have these people who can see where things are headed. I have no idea if Metternich's intervention at this point could have prevented any of those wars. But I do know that Metternich was a lot smarter than me, and when presented with this problem, he totally shrugged it off. He was so distracted thinking about 18th century France that he wasn't really thinking about 19th century Germany. I don't know if I agree with that, but... As part of the 1815 post-war settlement, Austria got control of northern Italy. As the Austrians moved into northern Italy, it fundamentally altered their national priorities. Yeah, so remember, Italy as a united country, just like Germany, does not exist at this point. You've got the Papal States, you've got um, <coughs> the Sicilies, excuse me, and you've got all these other kind of smaller groups, and, and we're about... 50 years away from a united Italy, which is going to happen pretty close to around the same time that uh, the united Germany happens. Before the war, Austria had been a pretty conservative and inward-looking power. 
Northern Italy turned Austria into an occupier and a colonizer, a role that Austria was ill-equipped to handle. Historian Paul W. Schroeder argued that Austria's expansion into Northern Italy, quote, forced Austria to lead and organize Italy, yet did not really empower her to do so. Austria had to pump Italy for taxes just to offset the massive costs of occupying it in the first place. An Austrian control of territory that later on a united Italy would want is going to be a prime motivating factor in Italy joining the side of the um, of the Western allies. Well, not Western allies, but you know what I mean. The Germany, France, I mean, uh, Britain, France, Russia. They had previously been allied with the Central Powers, but now they're going to side the other way because they want something from Austria. It was like a snake eating its own tail. The more difficult the occupation became, the more they taxed. The more they taxed, the more difficult the occupation became. Metternich was the mastermind of the occupation of Italy, and as the occupation began to deteriorate, he began to micromanage Italy's domestic policies another distraction. He brought yeah. in a wave of Germans from Austria to help administer the Italian occupation, which only further alienated the Italians and made the situation deteriorate even further. On the one hand, he was telling the German administrators to defer to the Italians whenever possible, while on the other hand he was having the Austrian bureaucracy micromanage everything from Vienna. Colonization makes hypocrites of us all. Hmm. Dissent was growing, and soon Austria found itself sitting atop a genuine nationalist movement. So the very thing that Metternich wanted to avoid in the German Confederation, which is uprising and dissent and political movement and, and people pushing for reform, is exactly what's happening in their occupation of northern Italy. Calling for Italian unification. This was way more than the Austrians had bargained for. Well, and it, it, it only seems natural. If you're starting to see a 19th century in which great powers have all the influence in Europe, and you're part of a smaller group of states that don't really belong to a great power, you want to be a part of a great power. So you see Germany unite. You see the Austro-Hungarians solidify their power you see italy uniting and, and so you start to see the modern europe uh, emerge by the end of the 19th century metternich set up a robust spy network targeting italian nationalists but this did not make the austrians any more popular even the more moderate italians who were willing to tolerate the austrian occupation began calling for a liberal italian constitution this was not a thing that the conservative icon Metternich could contemplate. Even geopolitically, the occupation of Italy made a mess of things for Austria. The Italian kingdom of Piedmont had been set up as a kind of neutral buffer state so that Austria and France didn't have to share a border. It's kind of like why you end up with Belgium soon after up here for the same reasons. But Austrian paranoia over Italian nationalism and their goonish spy network had soured relations with their Italian neighbor. For their own protection, Piedmont sought to establish deeper relations with France. You're, you're forcing that division, you're forcing that push toward a balance of power which is going to define the 19th and 20th centuries. This sent the Austrians into a paranoid tailspin. The French were establishing a beachhead in Italy, in Austria's backyard. Were the French behind the rising tide of Italian nationalism? The occupation of Italy had made Austria totally neurotic. This was a lesson that every great power would have to learn in the 19th century. The Austrian expansion into Italy may have looked good on a map, but the occupation did not generate any income did not increase Austrian no military prowess, and did not benefit Austria geopolitically. It, all it did was cause problems. You're not seeing any benefit, but there's prestige at play here, right? You're not going to just give up a concession that you gained because you just fought in all these wars, and you need to be able to argue that you got something out of all of it. 
In the end, it was a total distraction from the important issues in Europe that were threatening the fragile peace. With Metternich up to his eyeballs with problems of his own making, it would fall to others to prevent the next great power conflict. Uh -huh. The post-war international order faced its first major test in the 1820s. The King of Spain, restored to power after the defeat of Napoleon, turned out to be an absolutist ruler in the old 18th century style. This turned out to be a problem. 18th century Spain was dead and gone. Yeah. When Napoleon was in power, he imposed a liberal constitution upon Spain, one that granted real political rights to its citizens. Yeah, remember, Napoleon was much more than just a brilliant military mind. He's very much all about the law and science and history and education reform and, and voting reform and all of these sorts of things. I'm not saying good or bad in terms of how he went about it. I'm just saying he was all about fundamentally transforming the places that he conquered. Virtually all adult men were given the right to vote. And with this change, political life within Spain flourished for the first time. Yeah, now you're going to go back on that. You're going to try to revert back to what you had before. Not going to happen. Elections, newspapers, political debate, all of these things popped up within a few years, and the people loved it. So when the absolutist Spanish king was restored to the throne, his first move was to tear up the Spanish <laughs> constitution Not a great and return start, dude. things to how they had been in the 18th century. The Spanish legislature, which was full of proud Spanish liberals who loved their new constitution, were extremely vocal in their opposition. Yo, Radical Republicans and revolutionaries quickly joined forces with the more moderate liberals, which created a genuine political movement. Pretty soon, even generals in the royal army were coming out in support of the liberal legislature and the constitution. The king was losing control of the country. Virtually overnight, Spain was on the brink of civil war. It's something we, we rarely think about when we think about important major conflicts is we think they have a beginning and an end date. We think, okay, Napoleonic Wars ended at Waterloo and everything went back to peace right after that. It wasn't like that. Same thing with the First World War. It wasn't immediately peace at the end of the First World War when the armistice was signed. You had fighting going on for years afterwards in some of these places in Europe. Things didn't just calm down all of a sudden. There's ripple effects everywhere. At the urging of his advisors, the king reluctantly, very reluctantly, stepped back from his position. He would sign on to the liberal constitution. The king of Spain would become significantly less powerful, mm. and most of the business of the country would be run through the Spanish legislature, which would be freely elected by the people. So you're, you're going more towards like what the UK has with a constitutional monarchy. Spain would become one of the most liberal countries in Europe, with stronger political institutions than even Britain. The king said all of that, but he lied. Instead, he began exerting his power by vetoing every little thing that came out of the liberal Spanish legislature. Read the room, guys. Read the room. He fired all of his elected liberal ministers and replaced them with unelected men who were only loyal to him. It's amazing to me how many times in history we can look back in hindsight and say, how could they not see how badly they were screwing up? But it's a lot easier said than done. He then appealed to the five great powers and called for an international coalition to march into Spain and restore him to his full powers. A civil war now seemed inevitable, and by making an international appeal, the Spanish king was taking an awful risk. Once the great powers got involved, Spain could turn into the arena for the next great power mm. conflict. The country could be destroyed. Inspired by the courage and the success of the Spanish liberals, there were uprisings in Naples and Piedmont calling for liberal constitutions of their own. 
This movement had jumped international borders, which freaked out the great powers. Go back to the Napoleonic Wars. What's one of the primary motivations for what starts some of those coalition wars? It's the fear that what was happening in France would spread to other places. The revolution in France could could move into revolution in uh, places like the UK and Austria and Germany and all of these other monarchies uh, and, and governments were afraid that what was happening there would happen where they lived. Same fear hasn't gone away just because they fought a couple of decades of wars. It was their worst fears realized. It reminded them of the French Revolution. Everybody needed to be careful here. Yep. Metternich was particularly freaked out by the uprisings, not only because of his conservative ideology, but also because the countries in revolt happened to be Austria's neighbors. In correspondence with the other great powers, he expressed his fears that this may spark a wave of revolution across Europe. Since Italy was in Austria's sphere of influence, the other great powers agreed to give Austria a free hand to deal with the uprisings however they wished. In eight so again, you see how the great powers are the ones who are exerting influence and control. And so if you're not part of one of those, you want to be part of one of those. So you're either going to ally yourself with one of the great powers like Piedmont did with the French, or you're going to look to unify so that you can form your own great power. 1821, Austria marched into the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies to the south and the Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia to the west. In both cases, they came to the rescue of the existing conservative regimes. In short order, they put down the uprisings that were calling for new Spanish style liberal constitutions. The copycat uprisings were resolved, but the central problem of Spain remained. Of all the great powers, Britain greeted the calls for a Spanish intervention with the most skepticism. Hmm. The liberals in the British Parliament wholeheartedly supported the Spanish liberals, but even the British conservatives were sympathetic to their cause. They had gone through their own crisis with the monarchy in the 17th yep. century. And, and we did those videos too, if you want to check them out. Even the most hardcore conservatives believed that Britain was better off for it. They viewed what was happening in Spain as part of a natural political evolution that every country must go through at some point. The conservatives were in government in Britain, and the conservative foreign secretary, Castlereagh, was dead set against any Spanish intervention. He publicly declared that he had never intended the quadruple alliance, by which he meant the four great powers that had brought down Napoleonic France, to be a, quote, union for the government of the world, or for the superintendence of the internal affairs of other states. He argued that the Spanish situation was not a threat to the peace in Europe. Prime Minister Liverpool agreed. The Emperor of Russia, Tsar Alexander, was on the opposite end of the spectrum. So we'll stop right there and we'll come back and we'll kind of pick up uh, with this. We'll go right back to where we left off when we come back to this in tomorrow's episode. Like I said, though, if you are a member or a patron, when this first episode goes live, I will also put up the second episode in a private link for you guys so you can check it out uh, right away and get the rest of this. Uh, and with that in mind, I want to thank uh, Nick in Allendale, Michigan, and Greg in Bend, Oregon. Thank you both so much for your support on Patreon. Could not do it without you. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.